Austrian Eugenio Mich was caught in one that wiped out nine barrack huts, killing 272. I stayed squashed under the debris of the beds. For the first quarter of an hour, I could feel 50 or so men moving around me, and then one by one, they fell silent and died. Italy's frontier with Austria-Hungary leveled out along the Isonzo River. Italy's first attack failed with heavy loss of life. But General Luigi Cadorna bloody-mindedly ordered another and another. Eleven battles in all, at a cost of 300,000 lives. They never reached their main objective the port of Trieste. Giuseppe Cordano served in the Julian Alps in a trench system just 15 meters below the Austrian positions. Between the two trenches, it's a cataclysm. The dead are scattered everywhere, half buried. Haversacks, rifles, rags of clothing, and human body parts. A couple of grenades fall in the middle of the dike where some soldiers are sheltering. And everything is thrown up in the air. Rocks fly and fall with furious destruction. Laments and screams for help can be heard from everywhere, but how can one move? How can one help them? I'm astride the crest, and I carry on, meter by meter, ducking my head under shrapnel fire. Ten meters in front of me, Zanni from Vicenza is hit in the head, screams, and falls down the precipice. I watch his body tumbling down. He was a good lad. I keep going, forever asking myself when my time will come. In the winter of 1914, Germany's high command told the Kaiser they decided to launch the major offensive of 1915 against the Russians. The generals ruled out total victory, but a decisive blow might force the Russians to sue for peace. Germany moved eight divisions from the Western Front to the Eastern, to try to break through the Russians at Gorlitza, in the foothills of the Carpathian Mountains. Now German fought alongside Austrian. Austrian Matthias Migschitz sensed the change of mood. It sounds wonderful to hear German troops speaking. Everyone is sure of victory, conscious of their might. You hear no melancholy talk, no bleak forecasts. Florence Farnborough, a British nurse with the Russian Red Cross, traveled with her camera along the Eastern Front. Her nursing team went by horse cart to Gorlitza. They had no idea a third of a million Germans and Austrians were massing to attack the town. We have already chosen our hospital. It is a well-built house with several nice airy rooms. We are surrounded by the Carpathians, I love watching them at night, when the mountains lie mysteriously quiet and passive. started to arrive. They came in their hundreds from all directions, some able to walk, others crawling, dragging themselves along the ground.
As the Germans got near, Florence's team was ordered to evacuate. And the wounded? They shouted to us when they saw us leaving, called out to us in piteous language to stop. We had to wrench our skirts from their clinging hands. Caught by surprise and low on shells, the Russians retreated. Infantryman Miaskovsky wrote to his friend, the composer Sergei Prokofiev. My dearest Seryozhenka, we're in a state of unstoppable panicked retreat. Our troops are melting away like snow. Only six to seven hundred survived out of a 3,000 strong regiment in one day alone. The Russian army fled, but not towards the negotiating table. They scorched the earth. Vasily Mishnin retreated through the village of Dombrovo. The locals received us well, but in the evening, when the Cossacks arrived and began to drive them out with cruelty, then there were tears and grief and cursing of the war. The Russians were looking for scapegoats, and the Jews of Eastern Europe fitted the bill. They didn't look Russian, and their language, Yiddish, sounded suspiciously like German. In 1914, there were four million Jews in the Russian Empire. Battered by pogroms and denied rights allowed the Tsar's other minorities, Jews were forced to live in specified areas, known as the Pale of Settlement. And even though 650,000 Jews served in the army, many Russian officers and men saw Jews as dirty, half-human creatures. First of April, 1915. The Ruskies make fun of the Jews, saying they can munch their matzos for now. But when Passover's finished, they'll sort them out. Send them to Siberia. Helena Yablonska lived at number 20, Franciszek Street, in the heart of Old Przemysl. A third of the town's population were Jews. They'd been safe enough there under the Austro-Hungarians, but now Helena watched the Russians root them out within days of taking over. Tuesday, the 30th of March. Jews are treated with no mercy. They cut the beard and sideburns off the old rabbi from Birja, then strapped him to a horse and dragged him away. They beat his wife. Jews are not allowed to own any shops. Saturday, the 17th of April. The Cossacks waited till the Jews went off to pray, then set upon them with whips, taking them from synagogues, streets and doorsteps. Many hundreds of Jews. What'll they do with them? Some of the older, weaker ones couldn't keep up and were whipped. The roundup will go on till they've caught the lot. Such lamenting and despair. Some hide in cellars, but the Russians will find them. No one knows how many Jews were killed in Eastern Europe during the First World War. 600,000 were uprooted, of whom 200,000 never returned home. After their experiences under the Russians, many Jews looked to the Germans for better treatment. German officers enter the main Jewish street of Mlava, north of Warsaw. 
the Germans tried to win the support of Jews in Eastern Europe by promising them liberation from the Russian yoke. Meanwhile, the assimilated Jews of Germany showed their patriotism by joining up. Emma and Fritz Schlesinger see their friend Ludwig Bornstein off to the front, one of 100,000 Jews who fought for the Kaiser. German Jewish soldiers mark Hanukkah, the Festival of Lights, in 1916. 12,000 were killed in the war. Nearly 30,000 received decorations. But while Jews were tolerated within the German army, many soldiers despised them. Ernst Knopper passed columns of refugees, forced out of their homes by the Russians, are now returning. I couldn't bear to watch as a Polish family struggled on foot while the entire lazy Jewish population traveled on carts. I hauled the Jew off and gave his ass a good kicking before making the three Poles with all their baggage climb up onto the cart. I let everyone know that I would have all the Jews shot if they didn't let the Poles continue on their journey. The breakthrough continued through the summer. This was the greatest victory of the Central Powers in the war, seizing present-day Poland, Lithuania, parts of Belarus and the Ukraine. As the Germans advanced, they entered a world half destroyed. German troops convert Russian railway lines to the narrower German gauge. Rebuilding the communication system became a key task, rich in symbolic meaning. Germany aimed to recast Poland as an independent state, but under her wing. Advancing troops saw themselves...